right, welcome in, guys. This is episode one of the Mayflower Sports Podcast. Happy to have our guy Christian Oxner with us, goalkeeper, Halifax Wanderers in the Canadian Premier League. Uh, Going to have some fun, figure out uh, kind of Christian's story, uh, how he got to be the goalkeeper of the Wanderers. Thanks for being here, man. Yeah, no problem. It's good to see you guys again. Good to be here. It's fun to do these kind of things, especially with people you know. Fucking no sleeves. <laughs> No sleeves. That's the type of respect Tank we're getting. Tank on the pod. That's the type of respect we're getting. Thanks for introducing me, bro. I appreciate that. Welcome in, Jake. Appreciate it. No, happy to be here. Happy to be here. Rough day for the boys, so you know. So you know I didn't even introduce myself. I know. It's all about the guests, man. It's all about the guests. I guess so. Fuck. But, obviously, thanks for coming. How do you want to start? You want to talk a little bit about... Growing up here, you want to talk a little bit about the league currently? What are you thinking? How are you feeling? Wherever you guys want to go with it. I guess we could start with the uh, the origin story of how you came to be the goalkeeper you are today. Obviously, the CPL is pretty new to, to Halifax. It's a new league in Canada, so it's uh, I'd say the first real opportunity for Canadians to have a chance to play pro soccer. So yeah. if you just want to tell us how you got there. Long version? <laughs> Might as well. Might as well let the people know. Yeah, so started playing soccer when I was six. Started being a goalkeeper when I was probably close to 10. Used to do lots of training, that kind of stuff growing up. You know, I mentioned some coaches and stuff like that, I guess. So I remember starting training. I would do stuff with uh, a coach named Gary Carter. He's just an old guy, electrician, but he was, he was a great coach. So I always worked with Gary Carter kind of starting out. Mike Hudson starting out when I was... 10, 12 years old, that kind of stuff. I remember training with uh, Benner. I remember I used to go watch the Dumbrack senior men's play all the time when I was younger. And he was uh, the goalkeeper for that team. So I remember he would do the goalkeeper training. I remember training with him. I remember going to uh, to like a local gym. I, th- it was, I think it was CP or Duke Danville, one of the two. Training in there. And I used to wear hockey gear in there because you can dive on floors, <laughs> gym floors. So I used to go and wear hockey gear and train on the gym floors. And yeah, then got to about 14, 16, you know, just kept doing the provincial programs all the way through. Was in the NTC programs back in the day when they were still around. You know, those are, those are good, good times, you know. A lot of, a lot of good people I, I came through there with. So. That was a lot of fun, and then, you know, went to university, played senior men's with uh, Dumbrack starting out. I mean, Jazzy brought me into that scene when I was probably, when I was really young, when I was probably 16, 17, I was training with the senior men's, which they have so many good players on that team back in the day. I, I know I said it a few times before, but I imagine a lot of those guys probably could have made the Wanders if the team had come a few years earlier. We had, you know, the Derricks, the Dannys, the... Sean Coges, you know, there's there's a lot of good players that were on those teams. I, I know I'm missing some, so. And we played against a lot of good players, so I remember playing, like, some senior men's when I was 17, getting called up a few times, then went there when I was after U18, and Jazzy was really good to me with that team. That flipped to Western Halifax, and I was playing that while I was at SMU, and then, yeah, kind of, uh, we went away one year, went to Nationals, we won that. That was crazy experience. It was really cool. Like, when I look back, that's going to be one of the coolest things I can say I've ever done is, is win that with those group of guys. And, yeah, I went through SMU those five years with Masut. You know, it was a good time. And I think I started with probably Hunter, too. Hunter was probably when I was 13, 14 years old. So I trained with Mike from when I was 13, 14 years old until I was probably, I don't know, till for sure the Wanderers, so till I was 22. So I probably worked with Mike close to nine or 10 years and always did a bunch of stuff with him. But yeah, so for the Wanderers, I mean, was going to SMU, doing a bunch of stuff. And I remember, I think it was the summer before my last season, we played the local friendly against Dusseldorf there too. I was there for that. Yeah, yeah that was I awesome. remember that. Yeah, that was a good time. It was, it was, a, it was a fun game, you know. So it was a bunch of local maritime guys. I, I, did pretty well in that game, so I think that kind of got my foot in the door, and then I was doing well with SMU, but right before, uh, in my last year for SMU, I went away to Nationals. I remember we were playing against uh, striker Nick Sulzma. He used to play for TFC. I went into a tackle with him and uh, separated my shoulder, so then my shoulder was all banged up and just spent my time recovering from that, and then unfortunately didn't get to finish the SMU season from that, so that's kind of how my 
university career finished. But then from there, I went into, got drafted, went into training camp. Didn't, and then I think, like, maybe the even before the season started, you know, Stephen came up to me and told me he was going to sign me. He wasn't going to make me go through training camp unsigned, which was great of him to do. And then, yeah, rest is history. Four years with the Wonders now. I kind of want to go back to, like, really, you know, at a young age, like, just starting to play. But a lot of stuff you just said there kind of, like, sparked some questions. I guess the main thing I really want to ask out of what you just said there, that whole story is the Wanderers coming to town and, you know, at what point did you get the belief that you could play pro? Obviously, like, anybody playing a sport when they're growing up, whether it's soccer, hockey, basketball, like, you know, your dream is to be a professional. But at what (laughs) point did it hit you that you could be a professional player? Yeah, I remember, uh, I think I started to take school a little more seriously, like, towards towards the end there, and then, you know, Wanders were kind of announced, and at first I was like, meh, I remember having a few talks with my dad, because, well, when we went to Nationals, and we won Nationals, you know, I thought, like, maybe then would finally be, like, you know, a chance for me to try and go pro, because the only time I ever really tried to go pro before was when I went to Toronto for, like, three, four days, went up to TFC. I remember that too, to be honest. Trained with them, but it was nothing. I don't think it was ever going to be like something where they signed me realistically, right? right? So, I mean, I never really, really had a shot at it. And I don't know, who knows how it would have went when I was younger, you know? When you get older, you learn different things. You get experience, whatever. Maybe I would have gone somewhere and not even played and would have been screwed. So, you know, I I think it was the best thing for me was playing. And I remember I talked to my dad. I was like, I don't know if I really want to do this, yada, yada. And then, you know, I kind of was just like, I might as well take the shot. So started going to the gym, you know, actually funny enough with Mac, we started going to the gym a ton, Canada Game Center back then. So just started doing that, rehabbing my shoulder, you know, stopped giving a shit about school, (laughs) (laughs) which I I wish I didn't do back then. But that's kind of just how it went. You know, I just kind of threw all my eggs into one basket and, you know, luckily it worked worked out. Yeah, with the team being here now, though, like, do you think people can have that belief at a younger age? Yeah, for sure. I, I I think so. I think it's it's it is a it's it will give more people belief, but it's hard. You know, I think I think people kind of underestimate you know the journey that it takes to become a professional and kind of how hard it really is and, and the reality of the lifestyle of it, right? So. You know, it's definitely overglorified, but it, it's it's a great profession. And like I said, anytime you can do anything you love for a living, it's 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 amazing. But it, it's different for sure. Yeah, like we can talk pretty much like firsthand how during the season, obviously we see a lot less of you, but that's kind of like what the sacrifice is. Like, how do you find like, you know, doing that, you know, chasing your dream basically and still trying to like have a life has kind of played out for you? Because I feel like sometimes – it's very easy to get, like, FOMO, where you're like, ah, shit, I wish I was there. But at the end of the day, like, you're also doing something that, like, any one of us of the boys that were like, hey, if I had one sport I could play and be pro at, like, we would jump at that chance. Yeah, I mean, it's the hardest thing. Like, you, you miss so much, and it's crazy because you don't even realize, like, you know, it's like last month was just such a blur. It goes by so quick when you travel, you train every day, you travel, like, we train, usually we train, we do stuff six days a week, right? Even when we're at home. And if you're not at home, then you're flying and, you know, you're out of town. So you can't really do stuff. So like this week, for example, we play Saturday, we train all five days, we play on Saturday. And then, you know, you get your one day off Sunday and then it's, you reset and you go again. And sometimes your day offs won't even be the weekend. they will be like a Wednesday or a Thursday. And it's like, the you know, none of my friends are doing anything on Wednesday and Thursday nights. And after time, when you do get a day off, you're just so tired, you want to chill, right? So it, it's it's definitely, like, a lot you give up, you know, especially because it, it runs through the summer months and stuff like that. You see all the boys doing doing stuff, you know, you want to do. But I think it's something you realize, like, once the season's over, because when you're in it, you just live in it. And it's just kind of like you look back and you're like, wow, that was that was fast. I haven't seen people in this long. How thankful are you that you play for the team in the city that you're from? I mean, you talk about going on the road, coming home and stuff like that, but at least when you come quote for quote home, you're actually going to your home city. Obviously, a lot of people on the Wanderers are from all over, not just North America, but all over the world. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. And, you know, it's 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 nice because, you know, like you said, still close to home, still close to family and, and stuff like that. There's two sides to it, you know. It's, it's You get a bit comfortable. You live such a, a comfortable lifestyle here, right? And then you have people who are out there, you know, giving everything. So, yeah, it, it, it's different, but it's something I, I, I for sure, once I, you know, look back on my career, whatever, 
whenever that is and things like that, it was something I'll be grateful for is that I had these years to spend with my family, my fiance, and things like that. Speaking of fiance, I didn't know that that was public knowledge now, but <laughs> yeah. the boy is engaged. We all had a, a bet. It was between Oxner and no, Andrew here. Ah, in. You were in it, bro. You were the top two I was two a big favorite. underdog. Big no, underdog. You, were, you guys were the top two favorites. Don't lie. Obviously, Ox beat you to the punch here, but we think you're coming in close second, buddy. Nah, nah. No? We'll see. We'll see. I don't know about that Hopefully one. You might get married before <laughs> Ox yeah. actually gets yeah, married. Ox got engaged. Know? We don't know when he's getting married yet, but you might be you might Lindsay be number one. Hear this. <laughs> you might be number one, buddy. But you kind of talked about the uh, Andrew talked about people coming all over the world and like to play for the Wanderers. Like one thing that I've noticed with you is like obviously you've taken on a pretty big leadership role. Like obviously like Nick lives with you. You're billing in him, and then you've really like kind of. I think the first season I realized like you were taking a lot of the the foreign players under your wing, like just kind of like showing them the city, like if they needed rides, places. Can you just talk about like where that kind of came from? Because I don't think that's a a trait that everybody has, where it's like you want everybody to feel a part of the city, feel a part of the team, and like whatever you can kind of do to make that happen, you usually try to do it. Yeah, I don't I don't know if it where it would really come from it maybe it's just from you know how we grew up like going to the west and stuff like that like everyone was always just like cool like that like yeah. even our friend group is is so diverse you know when you look at it right like the greeks and you know all the boys and it doesn't matter so it's probably from that i mean it's funny to say that every day i drive a key and rampy and in marshall the training you know so yeah. now i can speak trini you know it's 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 funny one of the only few guys i feel like that can understand those guys when they really start speaking quick but yeah you know those that's guys pretty cool that's sweet. Yeah, those guys stayed here in the off season too so we were going to the gym every day together and, and stuff like that like you know for those guys it's probably the hardest you know and dealing with visas and all that kind of stuff, like, you know, leaving, leaving with their families and, and stuff like that to come here, you know. It's something I it must be so hard to do, and, and I feel for them in, in that respect, you know, just to give up everything to come here. So, you know, I feel like if I can do something to help them in, in the slightest way, why not, right? I heard, like, on something else you did, or it might have been, like, an article or something, where you were talking about kind of, like, how you got into being a keeper, like, I'm sure, like, when you were, like, just as a kid, you didn't, you weren't just immediately a keeper. Like, same thing with people when they play hockey. They don't just start out as a goaltender. How did you make that switch from being a player and realize that being a keeper was for you? Yeah, I, I think the the best way I remember it is I wanted to try it in hockey, but there was tons of people who wanted to do it, and I was playing soccer at the same time. So just tried it in soccer, and, you know, my dad was, was hyped because the gear was a lot cheaper. It's just <laughs> Ten dollar pair of gloves compared to, to hockey, you know. My brother was a hockey six thousand dollar pads. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Our Christmases were always off balance with with Liam getting everything. So, yeah, I think that's that's just kind of how this the story went there. No, it's uh, it's interesting. You kind of you mentioned Gary and you mentioned Liam and you mentioned Patrick. Like, well, we haven't mentioned Patrick yet, but Patrick's obviously. Your other brother there. What's it been like, kind of growing up with like those two, and then obviously like Gary's influence? Because always like. At least I know, like, coming over, like, yeah. your house was always, like, full of energy. Like, the boys were always going. Gary yeah. was always just kind of, like, interacting with the boys, you know, chucking a couple chirps here and there, yeah. like, making you feel really welcome. Like, what was flowing at the Oxner house. Always. Yeah. Yeah. But what was it kind of like, like, growing up with, like, you know, the, the two younger brothers and Gary just kind of, how do you feel like that kind of, like, molded you a little bit and just kind of almost made you the person you kind of are now? Yeah, it's funny looking back because you don't realize when you live through it. I guess we kind of had a bit of competitive household, you know, like three three boys. It's always going to be like that. And when you're the oldest brother, you can't lose anything, right? <laughs> because it's like you never hear the end of it, especially them. So, yeah, it was definitely funny coming up. You know, we used to beat the crap out of each other all oh the time, you know, and those two would always team up on me. So we'd have some crazy fights. Like we did some crazy shit throughout the years looking back now, but some some just some funny stuff like, you know, I wish I could show the world the videos I have on my phone <laughs> of us doing stuff. Hey, we'd be happy to see them. When we're, when we're adults, man. Like, so even when we were younger, the stuff we used to get up to. But, 
Yeah, man, we just grew up, you know, just, like, always doing funny stuff, like, just always outside, you know, playing road hockey and, and stuff like that, and, and just, you know, beating the hell out of each other. Even when COVID hit us a few years ago, I think Liam came home, and we were always out just ripping road hockey on the street, which, you know, I don't know if I should have been doing, but it, <laughs> it, it was good conditioning at the time, and it was absolutely hilarious. I always just remember, like, coming into the Oxner household, and just, like, as soon as you walked in the door, it was like, all right. I got to fight Liam. I got to get him out of the way. And then I can maybe beat up on Patrick a little bit and yeah. then I'm good. But yeah. no, it's, it's always, it was always nice coming over to the house. Right. And like, I feel like too having that kind of like competitiveness in the household, whether it's, you know, just beating up on each other, road hockey, like it really kind of gives you that sort of like drive that you need to kind of have to be a professional, right. Whether it's, you know, training or making sure you're holding yourself accountable, holding the team accountable. But I always remember just walking in the house and being like, oh, man, like, yeah. and you know, Liam was just always like, if he lost, he was just always coming back to fight yeah. you like Liam's 10 minutes sure. later, 10 like minutes pressure later. Being the older guy, sorry, Jake. No, it's all good. Pressure being the older guy. But like, I feel like Liam has that extra drive because he's a younger guy. You can just see it in him. Like everything he does, he's going to go hard because he's the youngest. Yeah, he has to prove himself. Yeah, yeah he's yeah, uh, uh, always like. That. No, we love Liam. Nothing, ex- nothing against you, Liam, but. But no, moving. I always wanted to ask you. And I don't think I ever asked you like formally, but I always. This was always like a core memory for like for me and like your soccer career was, and I don't know how much you really want to get into it, but like I always remember the the Canada Games thing, where. Basically, from what I remember, the coach told you that you weren't big enough to play a keeper at, at the Canada games level. And that's something that always stuck out with me because the other two guys, we don't really need to mention, but like, you can probably figure out who they are. Like neither of them are really doing anything with soccer right now. What, like, how do you feel like that kind of played into like your drive? Because I always remember thinking like you were better than they were when we got, when you guys got to senior men, like you played over one of the other keepers, like at that age, it, like it, it seemed like, they were almost discrediting you because you weren't as physically built as they were, even though I think to everybody that you were the best keeper out of the three of you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean that's how it worked out. But, you know, who knows what it was like at the time, I guess, looking back. I remember there was two teams I was cut from that stung. It, it was the first year when I uh, went to Atlantics. I got cut from Team Atlantic. And then when uh, Canada Games got cut from Canada Games. And and honestly, like, when I made the Team Atlantic the second year, I, I played a little bit, and, and we got smashed. And it was just like, I don't know. I think there's a huge problem with, with you know, the, the kids growing up here and not being exposed to, like, that kind of environment, like, early enough. So even if I went to Canada Games, like, who knows how I would have done. Like, I don't think I was going to be ready for that environment back then when you're playing against kids from other provinces who have come through these high-level programs. And for them, it's like, you know, when you're the kid from Nova Scotia, you, you go there with an edge, obviously, but half the time the kids shit their pants. Like, it's just natural. And, you know, you come against kids from Toronto and, you know, the Montreal, the Quebec teams and and the Al- even the Alberta teams and stuff like that. They come through such these high-level programs where they're exposed to that kind of pressure so often. But coming from here, I remember we would go play Quebec and we lost like 6-0 and stuff like that. But like, we were never exposed to that kind of stuff until we went there, right? So it was, it's kind of, it kind of sucks because you never really, that's, that's, you know, maybe why a lot of kids never really got the chance to go to national teams from these kind of provinces is because they're not exposed to this stuff early enough on. Talk about kind of just, you know, those big moments. Yeah. And like, you know, people like feeling the pressure and stuff like that. And I know that I've talked with you about just in general, how like sports, a lot of it's just mental, right? What would you say kind of ever since you've turned pro versus like before even just like how much you've learned? And I've talked to you before, like saying like, you know, playing in certain big games or when you played that, um, you, I think it was U21 German team, like yeah. the big games you're playing in. And it's not like it's just another game, but you kind of have to go out there and just treat it like it's another game and, and you know, be yourself really. How has that really changed for you over the years since the first year you started with the Wanderers till now? Yeah, it's changed a lot. Like, you know, like I wish I could get excited as I did then for every game. Like that's just the reality. Like once you play so much, it just becomes routine, you know, and you just it's 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 not the same. Like I wish I got nervous for games, you know, because, you know, those are like the feelings you miss. Like right now it's like 
I get I get excited for games. Don't get me wrong. Like I love playing week in week out. It's the the games are the funnest thing, you know. And last year was tough because the games were so were so fast that it, it just didn't feel special anymore. You know, when you play every two, when you play every three days, it doesn't feel special, right? So the season's been a lot better. You know, playing every every week, you know makes a big difference because you kind of like get to build up to the games and stuff like that, feel that excitement. And, and first year, you know, w- when you sit on the bench for, for good parts of a season, you know, you, you get excited because you want to prove yourself. Right. So that was kind of how the first year went, but yeah, I wish, I wish I was, you know, it's the hardest part of a season because if there's 28 games, you know, so you're not going to be excited for every single one. So, you know, you, you try to figure out little things to get you up for them, but anyone that tells you they get excited for every game is lying to you. You talked about, obviously, starting the first year on the bench. I always kind of wondered how that dynamic was when, obviously, like, Yan was a much more experienced keeper in the world of professional soccer. He played for the national team, uh, the Trinidad and Tobago national team, and... What was it like when you were able to kind of, like, claim the net from somebody like that? Because obviously now, like, he's the keeper coach, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. So, for me, I always feel like it, it's – I've never played at a pro level in anything, but especially where your position is so singular, what was it like when you were able to kind of basically grab the net from him and, like, what was the dynamic between the two of you? Because obviously now it's probably a lot less competitive, him being a coach. He's more of a mentor to you. But yeah. I always think about that sort of stuff as, like, what happens when a young guy is able to claim something from, like, an older guy that has much more experience and kind of what was it like to be able to kind of, like, basically prove yourself that, like, hey, like, I know this guy's an international keeper. He's done a lot with his career. But, like, right now, like, it's just kind of my time. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a good feeling, you know. I mean, Jen was awesome. All through first year, Jen was awesome, you know. I think once Jen kind of got a feel for who I was and, you know, that I, I wasn't like, you know, some stupid kid or, or some arrogant kid. Like, I was just there to, you know, kind of work hard and, and learn. And, you know, that's kind of what my outlook was going into the season. He had a lot of respect for me. So, you know, I, I learned so much from John first year, not even just from, like, speaking to him, but just from watching what he does. And I think that's, like, a, a, something that people nowadays lack, like, these kids when they come into these environments. Like, you have to just watch people and, and how they handle their business because that's the best way to learn, right? You learn by watching the most. So, yeah, I think John, John you know, working with him now is awesome. You know, every day it's like a fresh new thing. I lo- he brings, you know, uniqueness to the training and, and stuff like that. And he wants to see people do well. You know, he's bringing in some young keepers to work with us and trying to help them move along, which which is great to see. So, yeah, it, it, like a lot of respect for John, especially in that first year. You know, when I came in and, and was doing well, he would always help me and, and give me give me pointers and, and help me improve. And, yeah, like I said, a lot of respect for John and, everything he's done for me any like certain memories you can give us like a story for, with him or like any like thing that he's told you not really just like technically but just like about being a pro or the game or anything like that you can tell us um not off the top of my head when i think of jen like off the top of my head i think of the times of practice that he's like piss me off man <laughs> <And> <laughs> just like you know sometimes so he's intense he's an intense guy yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I've learned how how to to handle it now. But I remember our first year when he, when he came in and, and you know we were doing one drill in PEI and it just sticks out like him just like smashing balls at me like back then and like you know if if you like mess up or something he'll like say something and something. I remember just like getting so fucking pissed off. At that <laughs> and then like, but it, it helped me. Like if I get pissed off at people, I train better, right? So yeah. I, I would just like channel my energy into hating Jen so much that I, thought, like, <laughs> I didn't want him to score on me, I right? It. But it's like I said, like, you, you become immune to stuff, right? So it's like I can't do that anymore because it's just, like, so, you know. But, yeah, yeah. When I think of Jen, I think at the times he's pissed me off and made me turn better. Because is that common, to, like, for that to happen, like, for a player to turn into a coach like that? Obviously, like Jake said, he's, like, super experienced. But that must be kind of a cool dynamic that you guys were, like, on the team together and now he's on, like, the coaching staff. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 more common than you think. I think it's happened a few times in the CPL now. I know there was another goalkeeper first year who played for Pacific, who's who's their goalkeeper coach okay. now, Mark Village. And yeah, Ledger Wood, you know, coaching at Calgary now, was in the league. Uh, is it David Edgar? I think so. He's was with Forge, and now he's he's on their coaching staff. So, yeah, it happens a fair bit. I mean, especially in the CPL, you have these guys who come here and and, and they're older players, but they kind of you know mentor the young players and. They gain that respect through the locker room. So when they become a coach, it's like, 
especially sometimes when you get coaches who are a bit older and, and more old fashioned, it just creates a, you know, another avenue for players to talk to, to coach, to, you know, coaches who have recently played and understand yeah. how the player works. For sure. Always, since we're on the topic of coaches, obviously, I think you've known Steven for a while outside of, you know, the professional environment, but what's it like having Steven and then having Alejandro who obviously came from Spain I would say had a very, um, I would say unique pedigree for the league where he was able to, he was the, he was at the youth academy f- for Real Madrid, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so what is it like having like their dynamics? Cause just like from the press box, being able to watch like me and Noah, something that we've always noticed when we're there is that Steven's very like calm on the sideline. You don't really ever see him get like too worked up where there's some other coaches in the league that, you know, from the minute the whistle blows to start the game to end the game, like they're just at it. Like they're just screaming, yelling, doesn't matter who they're screaming and yelling at where I find you can catch Steven a lot where he's he's very methodical and when to speak and not like kind of like overusing his voice. But Alejandro where he I I notice sometimes like he's in the technical box a lot he's the guy that's kind of yelling out instructions on where to be what's it like kind of having those two as like a dynamic yeah it's 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 uh it's interesting you know Mesut last year was more session based which was good for for coach but Alejandro has come in with a lot more tactics and, and that kind of stuff for you know what we should be doing and stuff like that so I think you know that's why you kind of see him he kind of leads the, the the charge for the tactics for at least the the pressing side of things and stuff like that when we play. So that's probably why he's more animated. But Steve is like a man's coach. He treats you like men, you know. You know, you get respect from – he'll respect you if you respect him kind of thing, right? And if you – like Steve will respect you if you go in and you just work hard and and that kind of stuff. They're very accepting of mistakes. It's it's a part of life. It's part of football. So, yeah, I think that's the best way to describe it is Alejandro is kind of brought in this kind of his tactical approach and things like that, and Steve is just, you know, a a man's coach. Yeah, the one thing I've noticed about Steven in the press conferences, I think Noah can speak to this too behind the camera, is that the one thing that I always notice with Steven is if, the work rate's not there. That's just not tolerated. If you guys like, if you guys win or lose, if the work rate's not there, that's just not tolerated. Where if you guys lose a game, but you know you guys worked your socks off the entire game and lost, like he's okay, like he's okay with that. Obviously, you want the three points, but at the end of the day, I think the work rate for him is like kind of non-negotiable. And I I almost like that in a coach where it's like you understand like the performances are gonna be up and down. Like it's just part of a long season. But if you're constantly working, you know, he can live with it. And I think that's I think that's probably kind of speaks to what you were talking about there is just kind of the more so like the work rate. But just to go into like kind of like the travel in the league, because it's something also like you've kind of touched on a few times with the boys and kind of just following the league more closely, like realizing like you might be in Halifax one week, the next week you might be in Calgary and then you might be in Edmonton, and then you got to fly all the way back to Halifax to play a game or two, and then you're in Ontario. Like, kind of yeah. what's that like to to have that part of, like, the, the league where you're pretty much the only East Coast team, excluding, obviously, Hamilton, but what's it like to have that constant travel and, like, those kind of putting those miles on your body? Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, you know, traveling traveling sucks, It's uh, but it's part of it, right? Something every team has to do, you know, it's it's – it's fun, like, getting to see all the cities and getting to see Canada, you know, because in reality, not everyone gets to see Canada because it's so expensive to travel here. So getting to go everywhere is, and see everything is one of the coolest things, you know. Last time we were in Calgary, we went, we went up to Banff, and, you know, who knows if I'll ever be back there again, you know. So things like that are cool, but I think the biggest thing with Canada that people don't realize is the time zones, you know. You fly out. You know, obviously, you go to Toronto, it's only an hour difference, which isn't that crazy. Winnipeg is two hours, Calgary is three hours, and then you get to Pacific, and it's like four hours, right? Yeah. So four hours is a lot, but, you know, I think it works for us because I definitely think it's harder to, to gain four hours than to lose four hours. Yeah. But, yeah, it's it's definitely different, like, flying across, because Canada is massive, man. Like, flying, going when you go to Pacific, like, I remember first year, we used to go the day before a match, and luckily things have got better. We usually go two days now, but... You fly to Calgary, it's like five and a half hours. You know, yeah. you fly to, to Pacific, it's like six and a half, seven hours, right? And 
yeah, it's 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 a long flight, you know, and, and I think traveling definitely takes a toll on your body. But I think it's something that the team has worked on to try and figure out how to help us the best way they can. So, what's an off day look on the road? You know, like you guys, you talk about BAM from different places you can go around, like um, you know the visiting cities you're you're in. Yeah. Like, what's some of the fun stuff you guys have done? And or sometimes are you just kind of hanging out at the hotel or are you usually exploring cities on off days? You try and have some fun or sometimes you got to just kind of hang out? Yeah, usually there's really no off days on the road, honestly. I think an off day on the road is usually a travel day. So if you fly from city to city, that's kind of the off day. But, like, yeah, when we went to Banff, you know, you go, you train in the morning, and then I think we went right from training up to Banff, nice. which, which was nice. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's like, you know, in the cities now, you know, I know, like, the closest Walmart. I know, like, the closest stores. So <laughs> <Seriously>? <laughs> Yeah, it's usually just, like, I know w- what stores to hit. Like, it's all the same hotels, right? Right, okay. So, s- most of the places, same hotels from first year. So, you know, like, <laughs> in first You've been year, there, done that now. Yeah, yeah. In first year, we had some, you know, some funny guys on the team. So, we got some funny stories from some, some stores in some places. But, yeah. It'd be nice. To, it'd be nice to when we get back to, to teams being able to you know travel out the country for preseasons and stuff like that again. Those will be. Fun is trips. it better for you when you're in a stadium where it's like packed crowd and like exciting and like good environment, or does it really make a difference to you? Like, do you look forward to those games more? Does it make the road trip better, or it's all the same? Before you go into it, I always remember one story of you telling us about you getting absolutely heckled in Calgary. I can't remember what it was when yeah. it was like the second season. It's it's a, something that like I always No, it was remember. my debut. Or your debut. Yeah. The Halifax fans are intense too. Yeah, yeah. I teams. mean, to be fair, Halifax probably gives it the best. Calgary's good too. I remember when I played there this year. Yeah, when I played there this year, like they say some funny stuff to you, right? But it's just like, you know, I don't know, half the time I want to turn around and just, like, start going back and forth, you know, <laughs> just, like, in a joking way, you yeah, know. Yeah. Like, when I was in first year, they used to call me a fat bastard, and, like, I should have lifted up my <laughs> shirt or something and, like, flex or something, right? Like, first year, it was my professional debut. I remember Jan got injured, and, and I was, like, went to Calgary, and it's, like, you know, everyone's stomping, going crazy, and you're just, like, holy shit, like, what's going on here? But, yeah, man, it's, it's – going to Calgary is a, a fun place to play. They got a grass pitch as well, nice facility, you know, decent fans right there. So, But, yeah, I mean, other than that, there's no really too, too crazy places in the league. Ottawa's done a decent job. They got some, some fans there now. But, like I said, you get me into it. Like, nothing is too, too crazy. Now. Which places has the worst weather? Like, you just can never seem to have a good time there as far as, like, conditions or, like, pitch conditions. You talk about Calgary having a nice pitch. Which, which, uh, which team has to upgrade? Uh, Winnipeg. Winnipeg. I was going to say Forge probably. I think I've heard a couple times. You've Forge heard. got a new pitch. Did they get a new one? Yeah, okay. last year. It's really yeah, nice. So, so then now it's Valor, eh? Yeah, Win- yeah Winnipeg so I know. needs a new field. And that when you go to Winnipeg, it's like it's just because we did the bubble there and stuff, but it was so hot there. Yeah. yeah. That's not bad, though, right? At least like the league's kind of like growing and they're showing that there's like – there's money being put into it, right? Obviously, like not every team can be able to afford to put in a, you know, like a new pitch or whatever. But we kind of touched on facilities there. What do you make of like the Wanderers grounds? Because obviously, like I know you're probably not in a position to talk about it, but there's been a lot of talk and like we're going to have Derek on pretty soon, Derek Martin, owner of the team. I'm curious about the the potential of expanding the stadium, right? And if that how that's going to impact the environment there because I feel like the Wanderers ground gives you such like a almost like an intimate vibe where like you're literally on top of the field like there's it's 7,000 people or 8,000 people but you know there's going to be seven or 8,000 people there every single game rain or shine doesn't make a difference but what do you think of just kind of the atmosphere surrounding the stadium right now because I think there's been games there where obviously you guys have felt like you've underperformed but you know you still have the the kitchen chanting till the 90th minute after the game's long over yeah yeah the fans are great you know it's it's something you know appreciate a lot you know it's just just the people who always you know you have those people who will always come out and support you regardless so yeah I can't say enough about the fans you know ever since I came into the team and, and came into the league they've been awesome and you know, they've, they've shown me support. You always get the few that you see, you know, roasting you and stuff like yeah. that. But, you know, it's common. And no matter what you do, I think for every probably one one fan, you know, you see hating on you and talking smack, there's probably 60 to 100 that support you, right? So yeah. you just don't see them saying stuff. So, yeah, the Wonders Grounds is an amazing place. You know, the kitchen's a great place. They will always support us regardless. So, you know, it's just about us going out there and, you 
Oh, shall I, shall What's it I, like kind of like going? Because like I always think about like going to the Wanderers ground and like, you know, not to, to crap on Edmonton, but like to go to Edmonton and like play in front of like 800 people where it's like, you know, you're in Halifax, it's like 8,000. Like how, yeah. like what is that dynamic like where it's like you go to a stadium where there's not many people there, but you know you still kind of have like a job to do. Yeah, there's not even 800 people in Edmonton. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was generous. Um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah, it's just the professionalness of it, you know? It's just, you do it because, you know, you come home to play in front of your fans and things like that. And, and like I said, you do it because you're paid to do it too, you know? At the end of the day, it is a job, you know? And, and it's a cutthroat job because if you don't do it, then you're gone, you know? It's, a lot of places it's pretty tough to fire you from, but in, in professional sports, it's pretty easy to fire you from, right? So, you know, that's kind of the outlook you have to have is, you know, you have to do this because, you know, it's, it's your job and... You, you want to play again next year? You got to go out there and do it, do it yeah. here. So when you first like joined the team, like you first signed, and of course it was the first year of the team. Yeah. What was kind of like the that? orientation stuff like? Like you know, not the actual yeah. game stuff, practice stuff, but just like all the stuff you had to go through and things like that. Can you tell us about kind of the process of like when you first joined the team? Yeah, when I first joined the team, it was hilarious because I was so <laughs> young. I was just coming to university, like I was such a shithead. Like I was doing. <laughs> I remember we had, like, a few guys on the team who were so young. Like, our team was just pretty unbalanced with young guys and older guys. And honestly, that was hilarious. Like, doing – I did some funny stuff for year with some of the guys. Like, just, like, you know, just, like, straight banter. Like, nothing, like, illegal or insane. But, like, yeah. just, like, some funny, funny stuff. And, yeah, it, orientation, like, yeah, it's fun. Like, y y c like, when you do it for the first time, it's fun. Like, I wish I would have, you know, really appreciated those moments more. Like, when you go to, like, the meet and greets for, like, the first time and – you get introduced to the city for, like, the first time, you know. Everything for the first time was so cool. And, you know, we went away to Putacana preseason, and, and that was so fun. And we thought that was going to be it every year, right? And it's been, like, screwed up since because of COVID and, and stuff like that. And, yeah, that was a hilarious time, too, right? With, like I said, some of the boys, like, you know, I've known Rampy for so long now. And, you know, he, he was my roommate there. And that's how we first got to know each other and, and stuff like that. Like, Peter, I've known for so long. And, you know, we had some... We were just, like, doing some funny stuff in Putacana. Like, he was, you know, wrestling in the pool and stuff. <laughs> like, just being funny like that. So. I forgot about that, man. Because I was, I, was I was in Dominican the same time you were there. I was trying to meet up. But you were, like, five hours away. But, like, you guys played a couple games there. But yeah. would you say it was more so, like, a team-building trip? Like, you got to tell, tell us about what that was like. Because I know you're, you know, in the pool and, like, you know, hanging out at dinner and stuff. But, like, that, that's a pretty cool spot to be, like, a team builder. Yeah, yeah, I know I know. I make it sound great. But, you know, it's it's preseason, so it's tough. I mean, I think we had one day off near the end, right, before we flew home. But it was, like, a week and a half of just, like, constant, like, two a day. Is, you know, you train twice a day. You know, usually it'd be, like, a morning because it wasn't so hot. You would go out and train, and then the afternoon was more, like, tactics because, you know, it was it was so hot, right? So, you know, when you're young, it's like you come into this environment and, and it's like, oh, holy shit, like, this is crazy, you know, like, training so often and, and, and stuff like that. Like, yeah, I remember uh, we played against Valor there, Valor, like, just a preseason game, and I think it was, like, nail-nail or something like that. And, and I came into the game and, and the ball came through over the top and it's, like, went out to play it and tried to, like, thigh it and I just, like, killed it and the striker just came and, and tapped it in from, like, 20 yards and it was, like, holy fuck, like, this is how my professional career starts, yeah. like, Jesus Christ, like, yeah. you know, and I was, like, just, like, pissed and, like, so down after that, but, you know, it's just, like, you know, you, you just, like, move on from it, you sleep, you, you know, it's not that big a deal, it's only preseason, but it was a pretty crazy way to start my professional career, like, first game, just, like, screwing up, but, you know, hey, you it was the best thing that early. happened. Yeah, you exactly. You got out of the way early. Yeah. But you, you're talking about, obviously, now, like, um, kind of, like, the, the, the first season, and obviously we're in the middle of, what is this, year four for you? Yeah. yeah, year four. So what's it like kind of having, kind of growing with the league? Obviously you started your progression as a professional when the league kind of birthed, right? How do you how do you feel like the league's progressed and what are some of the things that you think they, they, they do well and what are some of the things that you wish you could see differently out of the league? Because I know people have various opinions on the CPL, on, you know, we'll say, like, the quality or, like, how it's run, kind of, like, the business structure behind some of the teams. But I think, for me, like, being a season ticket holder in the first year and, like, now getting to go to the games as a media member, there's been, like, a massive sort of, like, stylistic difference from, like, how it was, like, the first year. Like, the first year felt like a lot of kick and run, 
balls over the top, like a lot of scrappy goals. And now like you're actually starting to see some real quality, like the, um, and there was been, there's been some signings from the league too. Um, the, the guy from York, I always forget his name is Abzi. Abzi. Yeah. So like he, he signed for like the second division in France. And then I know, um, the guy from cavalry, I, I always forget his name too, but I always call him mini Conte. Cause that's yeah. just what he reminded me. He was just ball collector in the midfield. I think he signed in the Scottish premiership. So, like, they're starting to get some players that are moving abroad, but just the overall quality, like, what do you make of the kind of the progression from year one to year four? Yeah, I think it's 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 changed a lot. I think year one, it, it was still it was still really good, but I think, you know, it's either a lot of players who have grown in the league and the quality has just continued to rise. And I think you see some really good football, you know. I think it's it would be interesting. I wonder, you know, what would have happened to the growth of the league. You know, COVID kind of screwed everything up there for two years, screwed up every league. But, yeah, it's kind of funny because I know I was kind of, you know, crapping on these teams that go play the MLS teams like midseason and stuff. But I think it would be an interesting thing to do in the CPL. You know, you get some teams come over from Europe, play a preseason game or two just to see where the league stands. Like, every time the league goes and, and plays against, you know, MLS teams now, they, they fare, you know, reasonably well. It's not like yeah. anyone gets, you yeah. know – disproportionately like killed. there was in the canada like, cup like there was i can't even think of a blowout like i don't think yeah. anybody got blown out like you might lose like you know two nil or three one but it's like you're still competitive biggest win was like three goals I think. yeah so like that just goes to show kind of like where the league's at yeah yeah exactly you know the, the league is, is 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 doing really well and you know i think we, we did decent against toronto chances were there maybe on a different day it goes different but yeah, I think the league has grown substantially, and, and it's good to see players leaving the league. I think that's the most important thing to help it grow is for players to get out. I think it's so crazy that it took, like, TFC to bring on pretty much, like, their four best players to really have a chance in the game. Like, you guys dominated for that, like, that whole first half, in my opinion. Like, I don't think that first half could have went any better unless you scored. But that just goes to show kind of, like, for me and, like, you know, kind of some, like, naysayers that, like, hey, like, Jonathan Osorio, a Canadian international, like, had to come on the field to try and make a difference. Like, Akinolo had to come on. Like, Jimenez had to come on. Like, they're, they're, these are, like, household names in the MLS that had yeah. to come on to, to, to try and pull that game out. And Bob Bradley, when we were talking to him in the press conference, he had, like, nothing but praise for the Wanderers and the ground. So, like, I think that just goes to show, like, the league's on the right track. And it's, yeah. it's nice to, to be a part of it, to be honest. Like, I think it's, it's cool to see. And, obviously, it's probably pretty cool for you to play in. But just to kind of get off the soccer topic a little bit, we can go back to it. But I just want to kind of know, like, and the people probably kind of want to know, like, what do you do in, like, your spare time? Because, like, obviously you mentioned, like, there's not very much of it. But, like, what do you enjoy? Like, obviously we know, like, between the two of us or the three of us that, like, you're a big sports guy. So, like... You could just even tell us, like, you know, what sports you like or just, like, kind of, like, how you spend your spare time because I feel like a lot now with, like, social media, people obviously, like, want their privacy because everybody's life's so out there. But I think yeah. the fans don't really know much about, I think, the players here and, like, what they do. Yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> depends on the week. Like, you know, sometimes, like, this week's been hard. So, like, my spare time, I've just been sitting sitting around watching, you know, Netflix and Amazon and stuff like that, but there's not really much sports on, but, you know, basketball guy, like my sons, you know, yeah. when football comes around, I love fo watching football, you know, you know, just been, but I've been, you know, going back to school a little bit too, like, you know, last year I, I found like, you know, when, when stuff wasn't going as good as it could for me, you know, like when you have those downturns, you need something to, to take your mind off football, and I found that's the most important thing. So I've been trying to find, like, these secondary hobbies and, you know, doing some extra classes and, and working towards a different degree was something I found that's, you know, just, just something to occupy my mind so it's not constantly about football. So it allows me to enjoy it more because, you know, if you live inside your own head, then you're, then you're screwed. I know you, you really like to uh, trade cards and, like, sports cards and, like, sports memorabilia. Like, how did you get into that? Because, like, obviously, like, as a we'll call it a side hustle, like, it can be pretty, like, lucrative, and, you know, you can make some money on it and do it, but, like, how did you kind of get into that? Because for me, like, 
when you were talking about it, I was like, oh, shit, like, you know, that'd be pretty cool to do. And then I started like looking at it, and I was like, I was like, holy crap. I was like, there's, like, 50 different cards of one guy. Like, how the hell does he even know who to buy? Like, how does he know who's going to sell, who's going to get there? But do you just want to talk a little bit about, like, kind of, like, the trading cards? Because I think that's a really cool thing. And then even, like, the NFT space you kind of gotten into, we've talked to you quite a bit about the the NFT kind of trading. Is that something that you would say, like, you're still kind of into? Yeah, it's tough. Like, uh, I always get so into this stuff in the off season, and then once the season comes around, it's like, you know, like I'm, I'm barely checking stuff and stuff like that. So it's good. Like I have a stockpile of cards that, you know, who knows if, if I need some cash, I could just sell a few, <laughs> sell a few quick, but like yeah. just holding them for now. But yeah, it's like a mini stock market, man. It, it really is. You know, cards are funny. I got into it. Like I think when COVID f- hit the first time, you know, and um, I just went and met some guy at Timmy's and, and just bought like a ton of cards off of, off of him, like a bunch of Crosby cards and stuff. And that kind of got me into collecting, you know, Crosby cards and then, Spying a few Crosby cards off eBay, and from that, I met up with this other guy one, one time, just at Tim Hortons, to buy some more cards, and he told me about this, you know, site on Facebook I could get cards off of, and just started buying on Facebook, selling on eBay, and just kind of making money that way. I had a huge tub of hockey cards, basketball cards, football cards, and I remember what Ox was like, yeah, man, I sold this car for, card for like 80 bucks, and I was like, what the hell? I, like, I, and I, I literally went through every single, I had, I must've yeah. had like 6,000 cards in this tub and I went through every single one just on eBay. Just like, is this worth anything? Is this worth anything? anything? Any luck? Is this worth, there was a couple that were worth quite a few, but like, obviously like, I think Ox will be able to talk about it a little bit more like the PSA grading, like it matters kind of like what shape the cards in, like how it's kind of printed. But I just remember when that first, like kind of like wave of you doing that, I was like, Holy shit, like, I might have some money here, but... Man, I say when your fiancé is saying, how are we paying for this wedding? You just (laughs) drop, like, six binders of cards. There we go. That's how we're paying for the wedding. (laughs) Yeah, right. She can figure out her own stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what about, uh, what about, I, I know we're going a little long here, what about uh, the eSports tournament? I thought that was pretty cool to watch. Like, the fact oh, that, yeah, the fact that your old that. man was watching, like, on your TV in your living room, like, you playing video games, like, I feel like you probably never thought you'd see the day that happens, let alone, like, just playing on Twitch and a bunch yeah. of people watching you. What was like that like? It seems yeah, like it was a pretty funny. fun time. Yeah, it's funny. I'll say one more thing. The card, they like the card community in Halifax is crazy too. Like they have shows every month, like oh, the exhibition park. So those those are really dope. But yeah, the, the shirt I brought today, I actually got from from the ECPL there. It's funny enough, but yeah, that was that was a funny time. I mean, just like going through COVID, and it's like you know, I don't really game too 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 crazy like that anymore. You know, like I'm more just a casual guy now. Like FIFA was crazy. It takes <laughs> yeah, FIFA was nuts. that was like Do you remember? Full lockdown, right? Oh, my God. We had some crazy years on FIFA, man. When we were in high school, to put this in perspective, me and Ox would come home. FaceTime. FaceTime. And literally play for, like, eight or nine hours. Career mode. What, the boys didn't have headsets? or No, no. It was just straight FaceTime. So if I wanted to show him something or he wanted to show me something, I could physically see it. We just, like, go through, like, a season on career mode. And, like, one day. So, like, to simulate, like, a career mode is, like, it takes kind of, like, a little bit. It takes, like... like, Three hours, two and a half to three hours. And we were just, (laughs) after school, just banging out, like, two and three seasons. Like, there was one year, I think, that we actually completed, like, as long as you could go. And, like, the game makes you restart. So, like, FIFA was absolutely insane. Like, I I had to get out of it. Last year was my last year where I was like, you know what? This game has just taken over my life, and I'm just not happy when I play it. Yeah, I think that's this year for me. Yeah. But, like, I wasn't playing too much, and then, you know, the league was doing a thing, so I hopped back on and just started ripping like crazy, and, you know. Was it, you one, won that, was it one player? Yeah, yeah, we yeah. won. So there was one player on each team, and you got a pro with you, right? Yeah, and it was like an aggregate score, so the combined score. Not to, not to talk crap on. I watching this guy play video games, man, no, but my d- TV. I'm, I'm almost positive Ox was the pro on the team. <laughs> Yeah, but if I were to play against the other team's pros, I would have got washed. <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure, like, you were the athlete. Honestly, the pro, pro FIFA gameplay just sucks anyways. It's yeah. boring. But. So what was it like in uh, PEI? Like, and talk about some of these, like, bubbles and stuff like that. Like, compare you talk about how really the past couple of years haven't been normal seasons. This is the first normal season, so yeah. to speak, in a while. I'm sure it wasn't awesome. You know, I'm sure it wasn't. But it's also, you weren't traveling these, you know, hectic, like, yeah. routes all the time, like, what was it like for the team having to go through that? And that was actually pretty pretty good re- year for you guys. Yeah, PI was amazing because it it was like just the team we had, right? I remember we made the final, and you know it was it was so fun because it was the team we had, and and we did well. When you do well, everything's easier, yeah. right? So 
Yeah, I mean, it didn't even feel like that long because we did well. You know, I remember th- we made a video afterwards, like th- the Dylan did, the media guys, and it was like hard to watch because it was like, man, like it was like, PI, you know, you felt so close to all those guys and, and stuff like that. And then, yeah, the Winnipeg bubble was definitely a lot tougher. I mean, uh, yeah, it's tough. Like it's tough when you go into seasons and, and you just like go raw into a season, you know, you don't play any preseason games and, and stuff like that. Like at least this year, you know, we got to go, we went to uh, Toronto. I mean, we played a few preseason games and stuff like that. And you don't realize the importance of those things kind of till you miss them. Right. Yeah. So to go raw into the seasons was definitely pretty hard. And, and I remember it, before PEI, I, I messed up my ankle really bad. So it was like, just like literally last kick of the last practice before we got on the bus the next day. I just came up for a cross and went down on my ankle and, and pop, popped it open back in. And, you know, I think that kind of helped me because, you know, being injured and stuff like that, you know, you get that extra motivation to get back into the team and stuff like that. I remember have a picture of me training in a walking boot. Like I was doing stuff in a walking right. boot and, and just like working so hard day and night to try and, you know, get back and get ready and, and play for the team. And, you know, I think that made it a lot easier for me too. like, Obviously, being injured sucks, but to, it gave me extra motivation to push even harder. Yeah. Can, can you take us through what, like, a game day is like for you? Like, let's say, like, here in Halifax, not on the road, but, like, you leave your house. Are you picking up the boys that usually drive? Like, yep. what's it like when you first get <laughs> yeah. there? Yeah, yeah. Talk yeah. Us I through, know like, that. <laughs> take us through the story until, you know, the game starts, kicks off. It depends. Like, if it's if it's early kickoff, you know, I'll usually wake up, like, early kickoff's, like, 2 o'clock. So, like, have a coffee, chill. We eat four hours before the game. So, we'll go to, uh, I think, Ella and Bears Lake now. You know, first year it was Athens, and but now we go to Ella and Bears Lake and get our meal. But if we play later at night, you know, I usually wake up, have a coffee, chill. I, if we, if it's a late game, I, you know, really enjoy going for walks now. So I'll go for a walk, get my Red Bull, and, and you know, hit the restaurant. And then from the restaurant, you come home for 20 minutes, and then you head down to the stadium, right? So, you know, it's pretty much just like, you know, you get your little routines. Do you have any superstitions once you get there to, to the Wanderers grounds or you're not really a superstitious guy? No, nah, not really. Nothing really crazy. You know, usually when I play at home, I'll rip a shower before the game. That's kind of just like my time to myself. And then, you know, come out, listen to some music, do some stretching. Always watch like, you know, a video on YouTube, you know, and then that's pretty much it. Just hit the field for warm up and, and play. So who would you say, obviously, like, you, you talked about Rampy and you talked about Alex Marshall and you talked about Akeem. Would you say, like, those three, and then obviously, like, you have Nick living with you now. Would you say, like, those three, though, would kind of say, like, say, you know, your your better friends on the team that you've kind of made? Obviously, with the league, there is a lot of turnover, but you four have been a pretty big staple. And, like, obviously, like, Peter has been another guy yeah. that's been a pretty big staple in the team. Would you say, like, those kind of guys that have been around the longest, maybe you would say, like, they don't have to be your best friends, but maybe, like, your closest friends on the team or people that you just kind of, like, enjoy being around. Yeah, yeah. Corey, too, you know. Mateo. I was always yeah. cool with Mateo. He's he's leaving now, you know. Good for him. You know, Aiden's coming. Aiden's a cool guy. But, yeah, for sure, those guys I'm definitely probably, you know, a bit closer with. But, you know, not like, we never do anything too crazy. Like, you know, it's hard to chill outside of, uh, outside of football. So, it's, it's just nice. Like, you know, it's always the thing the guys say. It's when people are tired, they miss the locker room the most. And, you know, we have a cool team, you know, and I'm always just trying to be cool w- with everyone, especially been there the longest. I just try to check in on people and yeah. talk to people. So pretty cool with, with mostly everyone. Cello is, it, too. is it like almost like, like not clicky, but like, do you feel like it's kind of like each guy kind of has their group where it's like, you know, like X, Y, and Z might hang out together and then like A, B, C, D might hang out together like more than, or is it really like kind of just like, you all kind of embrace each other and you all like kind of like mingle with each other. Yeah, I think there's a bit of both. Like everyone will mingle with each other. Like if someone's going out they'll, or doing something, they'll always tell everybody, you know, and, and a bunch of guys will go. But there's definitely is their groups, but that's just, you know, the natural course yeah. of things. And it's it, it'll always be like that, right? So I just have to make sure if things, you know, go off the tracks and, and stuff like that, that the clicks don't separate the team. But, yeah. you know, I don't think we'll have that problem. Obviously, talk about winning nationals uh, with your um, Dirty Nellies team. Yeah. What's like, you know, you talk about your debut. Like, that was kind of an interesting time for you, like that first goal and stuff like that. But what are some core memories and just a couple of stories you could tell us really before we wrap things up of, like, favorite game you've played or, like, favorite, you know, time in a city with some of your teammates you've had or – any real, like, core memories you have, whether it's on or off the pitch? Yeah, I mean, Nationals I'll always remember the most because it was hilarious. Like, you know, 
it was so funny, like, going there, we get there, our first, like, our day off is, like, the first day, right? So, and it's, like, a, we're, like, a, a decently young team, but there was a bunch of older guys, right? So, you're, you're going to war with a bunch of older guys that are about to play five games in five days. Like, it's insane. Yeah. yeah. Like, looking back, it's, like, insane. Like, who plays five games yeah, in five nuts. days, right? Yeah. So, it's, like, you know, by the end of it, it's just, like, who's ever healthiest gets to go on the field, right? So, we had some, <laughs> some guys, like, some of our best players are just, like, on the bench and, and stuff like that. Like, I have videos of Wes, like, always in the ice tub and stuff like that. Like, you know, like, I shouldn't ever be a thing in soccer any sport but especially soccer five games in five days is nuts yeah so you know I'm go, like you know just like hanging out with like every day just like like go, we go play or you go do whatever and then you you know i think we played in the morning most days you go walk to the mall like get some greasy like greasy food <laughs> from the mall and ju just like mouth that right that was like your supper or whatever yeah. and then you go back and you know it was like i think it was always like four guys in a room and it was like just like and I'm trying to remember who my room was. I think I had Leo. I think I had Alex Cordoba. He was hilarious, man. He was hilarious. I remember one year I had Alex Cordoba and Mo Carcada. That was hilarious, man. Those two together. Shout out to Mo. Big yeah, Mo plays on my soccer team, <laughs> FSMSL, baby. Yeah, shout out to Mo. The, the, the real men's league, we'll call it. Yeah, the real men's league. <laughs> I'll never forget when Mo like unplugged Alex Cordoba's PlayStation and it wouldn't turn back on and 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 Doba just starts telling them, Mo, you pay or you pay, <laughs> <laughs> you pay or you pay, and it was like that for like two or three days till the thing finally turned back on. I have videos of like us at Nationals and like. Alex Cordova, the funniest guy, man. Just, like, sitting there playing Fortnite, like, two minutes before you have to be <laughs> down for the bus. And it's just, like, man, we just, like, do – that trip was so funny. I, I remember we were just, like – because it was uh, it was in B.C., so it was, like, four-hour time difference, right? So we got there, like, that night. We were off the next day. And we probably all woke up at, like, you know, 6.30, 7 a.m., right? And, and – uh, just like ripping FIFA and like Doba so loud, right? And we're just like ripping FIFA and he's like screaming and, <laughs> and stuff like that. And it was like 7 30 in the morning and the guy's like screaming and you know, yeah, man, just some 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 funny stories like that. Favorite game I played in, man. Dude, that's a tough one, but man, I honestly might have to be the TFC one this year, in all honesty, you know, playing against MLS team. I know it sounds cliche, but I didn't get to play the game last year, and I got to this year, and it's, you know, it's, like I said, sometimes you just don't you get up for games, you know? It's hard to find those games. Like, this year was one of those games for me. So to finally be able to, do, to play against an MLS team was, was something super cool, so. Another funny story that, uh, and we're just probably going to wrap it up here soon, but I always think, like, this is the funniest story when you played West Soccer with the boys, and yeah. the boys went to North Carolina, and everybody got food poisoned. Yeah, Golden Corral. Could yeah. you just tell the boy, like, just tell the audience about that story? Because, like, I just, some of the stuff that was going on, like, Mo that we mentioned, like, he thought he had appendicitis, and he was yeah. going to go get his appendix removed in yeah. North Carolina. His dad was going to fly down. Like, yeah, that, that was, was just madness. Yeah, yeah, I remember, like, <laughs> I remember I woke up in the middle of the night. We went to Golden Corral, like this buffet, you know, and, and we were just like high school kids. So we just destroyed the place, right? Like eat whatever, like, you know, the greasiest shit you could find. Like whatever looked good, <laughs> it was going in my stomach. So we were just like there, like destroying the place and, you know, get back that night or whatever. And then I was like, like, fuck, I wake up, I'm like, what the hell is going on? So I just, like, run to the bathroom, like, puke on the floor. Like, Yossip gets up to check on me, like, steps in my puke and stuff. That was hilarious. Anyone knew, knew Yossip know how funny that would be, like, stepping in my puke. And I remember just, like, being dead, like, laying on, like, the outside, like, on the ground. And, like, Angelo, anyone knew his own was Angelo would, would laugh at this, too. He's just, like, trying to feed me, like, cold pizza and stuff. And I'm like, fuck, Angelo. <laughs> and it was hilarious, you know? And just, like, so it was probably, like, two days and, yeah, I remember some guys got on the way back, but I uh, yeah, the West the West soccer is hilarious. I remember my grade twelve year too, like rented vans to drive up to to play in um in the finals and the semifinals and just like bumping music in the car with like Vasily and and all those guys like looking back like s some funny man. High school was a funny time. Yeah, too. and then didn't you uh was it back to back years or was it the same year that you you stopped two penalties to win? Yeah, it was the same year. I stopped one in the semis. Semis and then one in the finals? Jeez, yeah. buddy. But it's nice because, like, you know, maybe, like, a lot of guys who, who, who early, like, went to, you know, Toronto and stuff like that, they didn't go through, like, you know, 
high school and stuff like that because they were all, they never really got to play high school soccer. They were always leaving early, you know. They had to go to, to Toronto and stuff like that. And, you know, some of those guys don't even play now. So, you know, to be playing now and, you know, I got to do all that stuff. I got to do a bunch of fun stuff with my friends that, you know, it's like I think they're doing the West game, you know, at some point in the next, I think it's like in September or August, you know. Yeah, I think I heard something yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, Drew's got everything. And, and I'm excited to, you know, play in that game and hopefully play in that game and, you know, go to the bar after and just see all the guys, you know, because, like, those are some some great memories I have, like high school soccer and stuff like that. I, w- I wouldn't trade for the world. It, it is pretty cool, though, because, like, a lot of people, like, go to, like, different, like, academies or, like, they're traveling from, like, you know, Canada to Europe, America to Europe, or, like, just different cities and stuff like that. And you've got the ability, you've got all these stories with, like, all of our close friends. Yeah. And then, like, playing for Dirty Nellies and then playing for SMU, which is in your hometown, and then playing for the Wanderers now. Like, it's kind of cool you get to experience being a pro, but you also still went to high school with your closest friends. Like, to me, that's pretty cool. And, like, looking at all these different moments, like, all the penalty kicks you've saved, like, obviously that's not, that doesn't, like, define, like, your career and, like, you know, how you got started. But, like, you've had a lot of big saves yeah. like that that can kind of put you on the radar. What, uh, I just, I, I know we got to wrap it up, but uh, I want to hear more about, like, that under-21 German team when they came to town. You guys played one match at SMU, I believe, right? Yeah. And then one match at the grounds. And that was the first game at the Wanderers grounds ever, right? Yeah. What, what did you guys know about them, and what was it kind of like at this new match? Because obviously, like, when you saved that penalty kick, the place went nuts. We were all pumped. And I remember the guy that you saved, he just, like, walked off the pitch. Like, he yeah. he left. Like, he literally, the second that you saved it, everyone was celebrating, and he left. Yeah. So, like, it was a huge moment for, like, obviously you and, like, playing with all kinds of people that you were around your whole life. And it was the Selects team, right? Yeah, what yeah. What was the whole experience like? Yeah, I mean, it was it was cool experience, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's funny, like, a bunch of older guys playing against, like, you know, 19-year-old kids. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, right? I'll never so. forget before you jump into it, um, the kids coming off the field and the fans just absolutely <laughs> berating them. Yeah. Just anything you could think of, they were calling them. And in my head, I'm like, man, are we really talking crap to a bunch of, like, 17-year-olds right now? Yeah, like, 17 yeah. and 19-year-olds? But, no, go To ahead. be fair, they had a few good, decent players. Like, oh, I yeah. think one of their players played for, like, German national team, like, for under-19 and one for Japan. And they were a good team, right? So it was fun. We played at SMU that in the preseason, fr- in the friendly, like, uh, a couple days before, which was which was good. It was nice to play them beforehand. And then, obviously, we went to the game. And, you know, I made a few saves. Like, they were kind of all over us. I remember, you know, Eber scored a, a nice goal that game. And, yeah, I remember I sullied it so hard. Like, looking back, it's like, <laughs> what the hell was I doing? Like, if you watch, I go down the ground and, like, start fist pumping. And it looks hilarious. <laughs> hey, what's wrong with that? Uh, man, it, just, it was the start of a career. He knew yeah. it. You got to get hyped up. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, obviously, the penalty save was cool. I remember, you know, celebrating afterwards when Schaffelberg scored and, like, a few drunk guys getting on the field. That was hilarious. Yeah. yeah like, I always remember those things. And, and stuff like that. But, yeah, like I said, like, when you, you know, going back and going through it, it's something awesome to look back on. But when you live through it, it's just, like, you know, it, it's one of those games where, yeah, it was it was super exciting and super fun to play. The only other question I have before we wrap it up is uh, you kind of touched on it. There's there's not many grass fields in the league right now. Yeah. What's, like, wh- like what's the best way you could describe to somebody from going from, like, turf to grass? Because there's no other sport where you have two playing surfaces, right? Like, on a basketball court, it's a, it's a basketball court yeah. at, like, pro levels. When you're playing hockey, like, the rink's the rink. Like, obviously, yeah. the like, you know, if you're playing, like, a little bit less, like, you know, the boards might have a different bounce or the glass might have a different type of bounce. But, like, the literal playing surface is the exact same. Like, what's it like playing at the Wanderers ground on grass and then having to go to, I don't know, like, York, who has turf, right? Like, or going out to Valor. Like, what's that like to, to, to have that switch, like, constantly? Yeah, it's different. And it's hard on the body, too. Like, you know, turf's a lot harder on the body than, than grass, naturally. You know, like, grass is... I wish everything was grass because it would be it would be so nice, right? But it's a hard switch. Like you you kick the ball differently, the ball bounces differently. Like as a goalkeeper, you know, like sometimes on the grass, like even when the grass is wet or when it's dry, it's like a totally different game, right? And these are things people like don't realize. Like you know, now you see us like you know water the field at half times and, and stuff like that. Like the surfaces, you know, and at nighttime it it stays right, so it's really really wet. So. You know, all those things are, are just, like, different things that kind of like compile. And But, yeah, it's it's definitely a hard switch. You know, if we play on turf, we'll train on turf the whole week. But if we play on grass, we can only train on there two days before, right, because we don't want to ruin the pitch. So, 
you know, we were there today, which was which was nice. But you know, it's 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 a tough switch because, like I said, you have to do things differently. What's this is probably gonna be my last one. I don't know if you have anything else, but we didn't really touch too much on this season. What like how would you say the season's kind of gone? And I know it's been personally from from following it's been kind of like an up and down season a little bit it's been kind of hard for you guys to find your footing but how would you say overall the season's gone so far and what would you say maybe maybe not so much you personally but maybe for the team is kind of like your guys's goal for the rest of the year yeah I think the the obvious goal is is to be top four for sure I mean I think that's you know what we have to set our sights on now but it's been a tough season, you know, like, like you said, a lot of ups and downs, you know, losing Jao really hurt, you know, especially the season he had and he was going to be our guy, you know, like everybody loves Jao and everybody believes in Jao and, you know, we hope he comes back even better than he was before, but that was definitely a tough blow for us, you know, after starting the season and, you know, sometimes you go through, like you said, some, a lot of the teams in the league go through these ups and downs and stuff like that, but, you know, now it's just about regaining that footing. I think the middle part of the season is always the hardest because, you know, you start the season, you're excited, you know, first eight to ten games, you know, you have that, you know. And then I think as you get older, like I've learned that the 10 to 20 games is the hardest part because it's just like, you know, that just like middle part where you just like kind of float through it. And, you know, you're like in the thick of it. Yeah. yeah. And, and once you get into, the, you know, the, tw- the 20th game, the end is in sight. So like those last eight games, you're like, you know, excited for, you know, pushing, pushing to get to, to get through. But yeah, I think that's the part we're at now. We're just in that middle part and we need to figure out how to deal with it. This is kind of a, kind of a deep question, I guess, but like, and it's typical for me, but like, what do you want to be like remembered <laughs> for? Like, what do you want after your career is all said and done? You talk about like everybody always, every athlete said, so we just had Brett, uh, we were talking about with Brett Lather last year and he was talking with us about, Really, it's all about the locker room. That's all he really remembers, not even yeah. the big kicks he's made as, as a field goal kicker. Like, what do you want to be remembered for when your career is done? Yeah, obviously, guys want to be remembered for balling out and stuff like that. And, and, of course, I do. But I want to be remembered for being a professional, you know, whether things are going my way or, or not going my way. I always want to be remembered for being a guy that was a good teammate. And, and in reality, you know, it's, it's tough for things to always go your way, right? That's just the natural thing. It happens to everybody in, in sports. But I want to be remembered for always being professional, you know, and I, and I think I have been. I think, and, you know, no matter how things have gone, I've always turned up to training and, and, and you know, worked hard and, and tried to better the team, like, through that. So I would be remembered. I want to be remembered for being, you know, true pro and helping my teammates. Yeah, yeah. I think that's I think that's what most guys kind of, yeah. you know, want to strive for. Obviously, the individual accolades and the team accolades come with that, but I think it's more so kind of the person you are at the end of the day. Yeah, right? exactly. Football is only, what, 10 to 12 years of your life in reality. You know, yeah. 10 to 15 years of your life. You know, there's still a lot to live after that, so. Obviously, uh, we've gone, what, about an hour now? Yeah, we've gone about an hour, so we'll probably wrap it up here. The Wanderers play this Saturday at 3 o'clock or 2.30. I can't remember the time. Yeah, I think it's 2.30. 2.30 against FC Edmonton. I'm pretty sure I saw that. Yeah. So if you're there, I was going to say it's probably going to be out after <laughs> this, but hopefully, you know. Everybody turns out. Hopefully, you guys learned a little bit about Oxner. Obviously, he's one of our own, as uh, as the fans like to chant. But really appreciate you taking the time. Obviously, it's yeah, nice sure. to, to talk to a friend of ours and kind of dive in a little bit more to the professional side of their life and kind of let the people know just what's going on and what's it like to be a pro. Not everybody kind of gets to live that dream and kind of we're living vicariously through you, to be honest. You know, we love, at least I do, like, watch every game I just I'm just like fuck I hope Ox does well like you know if the team loses eh, it's okay I know you probably don't hate him but I'm just like as long as Ox does well I'm cool it, I'm I cool. gotta say it real quick it's funny like when your friend is a keeper like because I, I wish I could be like watching and like cheering for you to score a goal or something like that yeah. when your friend's a keeper like for us watching at home or when I'm watching like in the crowd it's like you want to like watch your buddy make a big save, but really, I don't want anything to happen. Yeah. You know what I mean, I want nothing to even happen remotely close to uh, kind of where you are. But this is probably the first time I've. This is the longest I've talked with you in two or three months, and it had to be a podcast. But yeah. again, we appreciate Christian joining us, and uh, yeah, uh, shout out to Noah behind the camera. He's our producer, and uh, a lot more than just that. So shout out to Noah, and uh, yeah, on behalf of Christian, Jake, I'm Andrew. We'll see you guys next time. Shout out Noah.